allow me to quickly introduce myself. My name is Sam Butcher and I'm one of the veterans of the labs, the team who joined when we were just uh, five people in a small co-working space in Copenhagen, Denmark. I'm a life scientist by training. Uh, my background is in pharmacology and for the past working with instructors across Europe primarily and the United States um, and Canada to help instructors with a, a variety of different uh, challenges and approaches to uh, redesigning science lab courses using technology. The initial work that I did was uh, very much focused in the UK where really there's no such thing as a, a remote or a distance lab course. It's just not a thing for understandable reasons. So much of the work that I did focused on using technology as a, a supplementary resource to enhance science education, particularly in biology and chemistry. Now that said, after a, uh, a few years, I, um, I transitioned to doing more work in the United States where online education is big. Um, in particular in the sciences, there are a lot of online science lab courses. And that surprised me, but uh, we did a lot of interesting work out in the States. And right now we have many hundreds of instructors using our virtual labs to teach fully online science courses, uh, both pre-pandemic and now, of course, there are many more who are using labs so, um, in response to the current situation. Through that process, we've learned a lot from some really incredibly talented instructors on how to build an online science lab course successfully. My goal is today, of course, to talk you through Labster to introduce you to the platform, but also to pass on some of the things that these instructors have taught us and that we've learned through this process to you all. And uh, I've also prepared a couple of resources, not just Labster resources, but other resources that some of these instructors have built in the hope that it will help provide you with some guidance from someone with far more expertise than myself. I can give you information on Labster, but uh, these folks know far more than I ever could about actually delivering one of these online courses. Um, so we'll talk through who we are at Labster, how the platform works, and then of course, we'll take some time to talk through delivering a, a remote science lab course. And so, as I mentioned previously, um, we do run effectively for many instructors, many courses in the US as a fully remote science learning solution. Arizona State University, for example, uses Labster for a, a fully online accredited undergraduate biology degree. Uh, the California State University system has many thousands of students using us in both hybrid versions and fully online versions of science courses. And uh, just within the past few months, we finalized a partnership with the California Community College system to take 115 colleges online for their science courses. And uh, of course, that's a, um, a very large project and that required us to build out some training resources um, that we'll be able to share with you all. And uh, I'll do so uh, after this session. Uh, but that said, um, being born and raised in Denmark, where there is no such thing as a, an online course, it's worth mentioning that Labster was never designed for that purpose. We were actually uh, developed by our co-founder Mads, who was studying a master's in biotechnology as an outreach project to engage students and to get them thinking about what it's like to study the life sciences at university. And from there, starting off in the, the early years, we built simulations to engage students and to improve outcomes in traditional courses, either through the use of technology as a pre-lab exercise or as a, a resource that could be used to flip the classroom. And uh, through that process, we partnered with universities in the UK and elsewhere on research projects to understand how to design and redesign these simulations to make them as effective pedagogically as possible and as engaging as possible for students. And through that process, we've built simulations that allow students to do many different things that you would do in a typical lab setting, and even some things that you can't do in a typical physical lab setting as well. So uh, we're able to cover everything from basic lab safety through to covering, uh, handling lab accidents, um, learning lab protocols that would be typically covered in a lab environment. And from there also doing very interesting things like uh, building molecules or uh, uh, observing um, uh, phenomena or interactions at the cellular or molecular level. Now, uh, for anyone who knows the uh, 
uh, the TV show, The Magic School Bus. It's a little bit like that. You can be shrunk down to the size of a molecule placed inside a PCR machine where you're seeing denaturation, uh, annealing extension happening all around you in a fully immersive view while interacting at a molecular level. And uh, the goal here is not to um, create something that's gimmicky, but to create something that's engaging and to help students learn the underlying theory that underpins the work that they're doing in the physical lab environment. And so there are really, I would describe four key elements that are worth noting that are built into each of these simulations. The first is a, a realistic simulated environment. And what I mean by this is we take real experimental, uh, excuse me, real experimental data sets and algorithms that are built into the back end of the lab's platform that allow students to change variables and observe outcomes and even make mistakes as they would do in a real lab. Now, there's an important note that it's worth me mentioning here, and that is that although we have these data sets built on the back end, and although we have algorithms that allow students to, um, to change variables, as I mentioned, there are limitations to what can be done in a simulation. And each one of these simulations that we've built is designed around a predetermined set of learning objectives and techniques. Typically, each one of these would cover what would be covered in a, a typical lab practical session. So although you have this open-ended back end on the simulations, a framework is built over the top of them that is structured. So you wouldn't be able to, with these types of simulations, replicate exactly what you would be doing in the on-ground equivalent of your lab. The simulation should be very close, but there may be some differences. And if you were to use labs, so this is something that is absolutely worth considering in terms of the design or the redesign of your course, as it may be the case that you need to provide some additional context to students or additional resources to ensure that you are meeting the exact outcomes that you're looking for students to achieve. The next piece that's incorporated into each of the simulations is uh, the use of storytelling. Each one of the simulations has been built around a storyline. Effectively, it's a real world challenge for students to solve as they work through the, uh, the simulation from start to finish. Uh, the reasons behind building this in are twofold. And the first is to increase engagement for students to create a, a scenario and learning environment that's engaging, that's inciting, that's compelling and interesting. And the second reason is a little more pedagogically focused and it relates to retention of knowledge that students are gaining. And this is done by allowing students to better relate the work that they're doing in the lab to its real world application and allowing students to build more effective neural bridges between information by giving it that real world contextualization. And uh, studies have shown that this has had a, um, a really significant effect on students' retention. And as a result, we've built it into every single one of our simulations. And the next piece is something that I touched upon briefly earlier. It's the use of immersive animations, interactive, typically um, cellular or molecular animations that are focused on bridging the gap between lecture and lab. So students are understanding as they work through the lab materials, how it relates to the, uh, the theoretical underpinnings. Um, and then the final piece is uh, actually a, an assessment component. It's a, a set of interactive quiz questions, multiple choice quiz questions that are built throughout the simulations. These, sim uh, these quiz questions are designed to actually improve learning rather than to assess students' knowledge. Um, it's based on recall-based learning principles. And uh, again, it's been shown to be very effective, but we do see many instructors using these as a form of assessment. It does reduce the amount of time spent on marking, especially when you have such large numbers of students. Um, they're being they're designed to relate specifically to the lab work and the theory as well. Um, so they do work particularly effectively. Most folks do use them uh, in, as a, an assessment component, either summative or formative. Uh, but it's also just worth noting here that um, this is going to be a little bit different from what you would typically do as part of an assessment for a lab. Um, what we see a lot of instructors do in the US is actually have students write up some form of lab report. We've even had instructors send through to students um, copies of some of the studies that these simulations are based on because many of these are based on real world research papers that have been published, have the students read the paper, play through the lab. It's a little bit like flipping the virtual lab, so to speak, and then having the students actually critique the paper, 
analyze the work that they were doing in the lab. And it's uh, something that I would certainly recommend considering if you're using a virtual lab platform, be it one of Labster's or one of the other resources that's out there, and there are many others to, uh, to choose from. And so uh, just one thing that I wanted to mention, um, this is going to sound like I'm uh, sort of, you know, showing off labs that this is not my intent. We're now working with about 800 universities across the world. Many of these prior to COVID-19 becoming what it is today, we're using Labster in an online or hybrid format in the US and Canada. And we've learned a lot through that. Um, and we have a, a lot of resources on the Labster website. And I have a link in this presentation, which I'll share with you all afterwards. And then in response to, uh, to COVID, of course, we have many more. Um, Labster is trusted by folks across the world, and it can be used in a variety of different formats. Um, if there's anything that I can do to help you all in, uh, in figuring out the transition to online, please do let me know. I can put you in touch with folks who've been through this process before. Um, you might have to stay up a little later in the day because they may be in America, but uh, um, these folks are passionate educators and are so willing to help folks out who are going through this. So uh, do let me know if there's anything of that nature that I can do to help. And so I wanted to show you here a, a short video that summarizes everything that I've covered so far. And uh, it may be a little bit choppy as it's going through Zoom, but hopefully it'll be okay. So the Labster platform contains over 140 simulations. And each one of these is built, built around a case study covering typically the amount of material that's covered in one lecture and one lab practical session. And as students work through these simulations, they'll work through an experimental protocol from start to finish, and they will do everything that they would do in a real physical lab. The only key differences are that students will miss out on the fine motor skills, and there will also be some limitations being a simulation as it is. Um, things like natural variability, of course, can be simulated to some extent, but uh, there are many different things that, uh, that can go wrong, for example, in a, a, a physical lab that can't necessarily be uh, replicated in an exact format in a virtual lab. Uh, as I mentioned before, students can do things in a virtual lab that they can't do in a physical lab. Everything from uh, interacting with those immersive visualizations through to repeating experiments time and time again with accelerated time frames so that if they don't get it right or they don't understand it the first or the second or the third time, they can keep going in a self-paced and self-directed manner until they fully understand what they are working on and what they're working through. Um, the final things that are worth mentioning are, of course, uh, that the, the grading and the setup is typically done directly through a learning management system like Blackboard, Canvas, or Moodle. This allows for students to access the simulations through single sign-on and for the grades from the simulations to be sent directly through to a gradebook. And so there we have a, uh, a quick summary of, uh, of labs so visually. Um, and next, I wanted to talk through some of the areas that we have simulations available for. Um, this is something of a sort of a, a US geared slide, so bear with me for a moment. Um, but really, the key areas that we have simulations available for are within biology, chemistry, and physics. So we cover everything from your very introductory level, uh, sort of uh, A-level um, uh, biology and chemistry through to some more advanced topics in biology, like um, uh, synthetic biology, for example, and uh, biotechnology, bioengineering. Um, from there, some of the other key areas are microbiology, anatomy and physiology, biochemistry. And then, of course, moving into chemistry, uh, it's not quite as, um, uh, as diverse, the range of materials, but there's a very good set of, uh, of simulations available for organic chemistry, uh, for general chemistry, and uh, even some for analytical chemistry as well. Um, and then finally, for physics, really, it's uh, the sort of introductory first level physics content that we have available primarily. Um, within the Labster platform. Um, and uh, there we have it. So um, a couple of things that are worth noting here. Um, the simulations have been shown to improve learning outcomes significantly, um, not just in online courses, but in traditionally taught courses. Um, and it's really important to note that the simulations are used in different ways and that impacts learning outcomes differently. In traditional courses, Labster is typically used as a flipped classroom 
or a, a flipped lab exercise where students are working through the materials using a different learning approach and it's self-paced, it's self-directed. It's helping students to better understand the materials, better understand what they're doing in a lab and to make mistakes in a safe environment in a virtual lab before getting into the physical lab. This provides students with a greater level of confidence. It increases self-efficacy. In particular, it improves learning for students that are coming into courses with less experience in a lab environment and lower levels of understanding of the, uh, the, sort of the materials. They have a little bit more of a way to go to catch up. Um, and in the fully online courses, what we've seen with Labster is that they are significantly more effective than other virtual lab tools. And one of the big reasons for this is that it's designed with pedagogy in mind. Most virtual labs were designed in America, you know, a little bit contentious this, to replace a physical lab. And we're a team of scientists. We never had the intention of building simulations to do this. We wanted to enhance traditional courses but we found more and more instructors using our simulations for online and we learned how to, uh, to build them into courses successfully. Uh, but an example would be the work that we did at California State University Northridge for a, a biology lab course with 2000 students taking it a year. They were using another virtual lab tool. I, I won't say the name of it. Um, and then they switched over to Labster and found that the, the fail rate in that course dropped from 20% to 5%. So another 300 students a year were passing that course that weren't passing it previously. So your choice of platform is important. And there are some key things to consider there. One is the, the educational quality, but another is the, the technical performance. If something is, for example, flash-based or it's clunky, it's frustrating, it often has uh, um, sort of errors, that can seriously impact the experience for students. And that can have a, a detrimental effect on learning. And this was one of the things that Cindy Malone at Northridge actually mentioned as being critically important for success with Labster. The experience for students was much more effective. So students stuck it out with the simulations and they actually um, worked through the course to the end, which they weren't doing as frequently with these other tools. And so I wanted to take some time to sort of step back a little bit from, uh, from Labster here. Um, partly because I'm just unconscious of time. Um, I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly, but we'll have more time in the breakout sessions. Things to consider when moving science labs online. Can you go hybrid? If you can, the approach will be different. And there are things to consider there about what you put in the, uh, the physical labs versus what you do virtually. Uh, for example, in biology courses, it's better to put more of the cellular and molecular biology type content online because it is much more uh, sort of abstract. Uh, you're typically using uh, machines where students are, uh, are not necessarily honing their fine motor skills in those environments. Whereas for things like anatomy and physiology, for anything that might involve a dissection, certainly makes much more sense to keep those in the, uh, the on-ground labs. Um, so something that's worth noting, uh, some key considerations, uh, considerations there. A question to ask yourself, what can you do virtually that you can't do in a physical lab? How can you provide students with an experience that they couldn't otherwise have in a traditional lab? And how can you use those types of experiences to achieve learning objectives in a different way than you have done previously? But it's also important to consider it from the other way around. Are students going to miss out on some important elements that you need students to be covering um, that you typically cover in a physical lab? And how can you overcome those either using something like a virtual lab, for example, or how can you plan to have students covering these once they're able to get back on campus? Um, this comes up in the US all the time. Consider students with accessibility needs. Um, students that have visual or sight impairments may need some additional support when using tools like virtual labs. We can help with that. There's also some great guidance from, uh, from what bodies like Educause out in the US, if you'd like some guidance there. Um, but please do consider that because students do have these needs. Um, keep students engaged, uh, consider a varied approach. Um, so if you're using a tool like Labster, consider how you can 
um, use Labster in different ways, having students collaborate and jump on a Zoom call together and actually work through a simulation together. Um, you can have yourself jump on a, a Zoom call with students playing through labs as well, rather than having everything being asynchronous. Consider using other tools, consider giving students studies based on the labs that they can analyze alongside it. Consider building in different assessment components. Engagement is going to be tough for students that haven't had a lot of experience in learning online before and may not have a particular desire to learn online. Um, there's some great resources out there on the web um, to give recommendations and guidance on this, um, but student engagement is going to be key to success. Don't underestimate how important it is to keep students engaged and varying your approach is a very good way of uh, helping to achieve this. Um, with that, as I just mentioned, consider using multiple different resources. There's a lot of OER out there. Uh, the Lab Exchange, for example, has some great stuff. Uh, the FET simulations are incredible as well. Um, with that, think about cost and scalability. Um, can you deliver something successfully at scale? Um, is it going to be affordable? Is it going to be feasible? How can you lower costs if there are some challenges there by using things like OER? Um, think about hardware as well, um, particularly for students that may not have um, uh, laptops. We have out in the US folks uh, loaning Chromebooks and other laptops to students, and that's been incredibly helpful. Um, it's something to bear in mind. Not all students will have the hardware that they need to learn online. And then finally, you know, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but Truly, learn from North America. There are some brilliant and incredibly passionate educators who've been teaching online science lab courses for a long time. They know the pitfalls, they know the challenges, and they know how to do it successfully. Many of these have written blog posts and articles on the subject, and many more will be willing to chat to folks as well. Um, again, do reach out to me if you'd like to, uh, to be put in touch with anybody. Um, and to that end, I've just shared a couple of articles and places to go um, for some guidance on this. One is the Labster blog, where we have webinar recordings with some of these instructors, white papers and other guides. Um, the Chronicle um, uh, article um, written by Heather Taft is phenomenal. She's a brilliant educator out of Colorado that's been doing some incredible things in the online space. And then the Inside Higher Ed, you may have seen this one as well, has some really good guidance there on uh, bringing a, a, a lab science course into a, a remote teaching format. And uh, I'm going to pause there to have my first sip of a proper British cup of tea after being back in America. And I uh, think it's probably time for us to open up for questions. So thank you all so much for listening. And uh, um, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Samuel. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, just raise your hand in the chat or flag in some way and we'll We'll ask some questions to Samuel. Um, uh, in the chat, Samuel, I noticed there was a lot of people talking about integration with their virtual learning environments. Could you just go through how it integrates with the systems we already have and how the students would go about accessing it? Yes, absolutely. So uh, the way that we would typically do this is using a, um, a a sort of a global integration for your learning management system. So say, for example, you use Blackboard, D2L, Moodle, or Canvas. Our team would work with your learning management system administrators and build Labster uh, into the, the LMS at a system level. Now, once they've done that, um, we'll provide guidance that can be sent out to um, all of the, the academics who may or may not want to use Labster. And then there's a simple guide that you would follow that takes around about five minutes to select the labs that you'd like to use in the course and to add them into the course shell as assignments. Once you follow that process, the simulations will be visible for the students in the course shell and they just click on the link to uh, play the labs to simulation that they'll see under their assignments. The labs to simulation will then just pop up in a new browser tab. Um, so there's no need for additional sign on. It's all authenticated through the learning management system. Students then play through the virtual lab. And then as soon as they're finished, the grades are sent through to the, uh, the gradebook. Fantastic, Samuel. And they, uh, um... Another question that came through is, is the obvious one is how do we, what's the general cost for the packages to get these things going? It's a great question. It varies fairly significantly depending on the, the scale, uh, how, how many students are going to be using it. Um, we do have a pricing page um, 
So uh, if you go to labster.com forward slash pricing, you'll be able to see our, uh, our full pricing there. And just one thing that's worth bearing in mind is we're still a startup. We're still a young company. That means that we can be flexible with things like pricing as well. We've put in place some COVID uh, response discounting and, uh, and, and we'll provide things even at cost sometimes. Um, so use the labs.com as a guide, um, but know that there are things that we can do to let you know, uh, you've got, to be able to support you. Uh, 27, Sarah. And I cool. can see there's yeah. a couple of uh, Yeah, I was just looking at those as well. Do you want to see about can... trials and um, lists of simulations? I'm wondering if it might be possible for me to send through uh, these after the, the call. Would that work well if I... Yeah, that'd be fantastic. And then we can share those via the mailing list. Perfect. And I, what I can do is send through a... Um, a link to a tool called our faculty resource page. On that page, you'll be able to play through any of the simulations as an academic. You'll be able to uh, see all of the, the details, documentation, the questions that are built into the simulations and full lists of all of the simulations broken down by subject area as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sam.